In this week's news, Booster 7 featuring 33 Raptor engines has been in the spotlight, SLS wet dress is declared a success and another Falcon Heavy flight has received a big delay. This is tomorrow's Space News. Firstly, it's time to talk once again about SpaceX's progress on the Starship launch mount at LC-39A in Florida. Two new sections have been rolled out, the first on the 23rd and the second on the 28th UTC. SpaceX have been transporting these at night to try and minimise the disruption caused as the sections are quite large so to move them they do need to close the roads on Merritt Island where a lot of other companies operate from such as NASA itself, Blue Origin, ULA etc. SpaceX did lift Section 2 during the daylight hours, however, so we did get a nice look at that. Boca Chica has been busy as usual, with a hive of activity surrounding the ground service equipment and booster number 7. First though, let's talk about the ships. This is the second Starlink satellite dispenser we've seen, and it has just been placed inside of the beginnings of Ship 25. Just like on Ship 24, its intended purpose is to spit out Starlink satellites like a big Pez dispenser in low Earth orbit. Delicious. The load spreader was lifted by the bridge crane in the high bay, which was a suspected move by SpaceX to prepare for Raptor installation underneath the Starship. And the next day, SpaceX did exactly that, lifting S-24 into the air. The Super Heavy booster currently slated for the orbital test flight of the entire Starship stack, B7, was rolled to the pad once again last week, but this time with all of its glorious Raptor 2 engines installed, all 33 of them. We then saw the chopsticks lifting themselves up the tower and then opening up as they prepared to lift the booster. Night fell, we all waited for hours upon hours and then finally the Starbase team lifted the first booster ever to be lifted by the chopstick catch arms. Not only can you catch boosters and ships with this massive piece of engineering, you can also use it as a fancy looking crane. The super cool looking booster quick disconnect followed shortly afterwards, attaching to the aft end of B7. This platform, which is used to access the Raptor 2 engines, was rolled underneath the launch mount, allowing workers to get up close and personal with the business end of the booster. This was followed by a test of the igniters, which you can't see, but you can hear. Loud ignition firing. Loud ignition firing. Something else you can't see is any frost during this cryogenic proof test of Booster 7, however there was plenty of venting indicating what was going on. This test marks the start of the campaign leading up to the static fires we're expecting in the coming weeks. This new booster aft cap has been delivered and it's what the 33 Raptor 2 engines are attached to underneath a super heavy booster. Remember Booster 5? It's an outdated design, pretty much the same as Booster 4, which meant that when it was completed, it was relegated to the Rocket Garden. It has been serving the role as a fancy lawn ornament for several weeks, but on Monday it finally moved again into High Bay 2, affectionately known as the Mega Bay. Following this move, one of the booster's grid fins were removed. Star Factory has progressed some more, you can see the structure of the building at the top has been extended and it'll be replacing the tents at Starbase. Oh, and this thing, whatever it is, was moved by a telehandler. It looks like the last sort of object I'd want to put inside my brand new multi-million dollar rocket, and I have no clue what it might be. Psyche, the mission which everyone within the community believed would at least bring us some certainty with a Falcon Heavy flight this year, has sadly slipped yet again, with a launch in 2022 deemed impossible by the team behind the mission. If you haven't heard of the mission before, the spacecraft Psyche will be heading to the asteroid called Psyche, which is a metal world, and the mission is the first of its kind where we can examine such a body. Because of physics, Falcon Heavy can only deliver the spacecraft in an efficient manner at certain times of year when Earth, Mars and the asteroid are all located in the correct places in their respective orbits. If Psyche was launched on this episode's release date for example, it would miss Mars, receive no gravity assist and end up floating somewhere else in the universe. These specific launch windows are really what have caused this bigger delay as the spacecraft should realistically be ready in only a few weeks or months before the actual launch window. The first delay of the mission came with a push from August to September stroke October as the navigation software provided by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory suffered a compatibility issue with a test bed simulator. 
this had to be rectified as dodgy navigation software is the last thing you want when you need to make very fine and specific adjustments to an orbit. As I speak today, this issue has been fixed by the team at JPL. However, they will not have enough time to test the spacecraft and ensure it is working 100% as expected before the end of the launch window on October 11th. This means that the launch will have to take place in the next available window, which is in 2023, with another window available in 2024. In the official NASA press release, specific dates were not shared and the agency said that those dates were yet to be determined. However, in the teleconference that preceded this press release, Lindy Elkins Tanton, principal investigator of the Psyche mission, said that July and September were the 2023 launch windows. Those weren't confirmed as of the writing of this script, so do keep that in mind. The recording of this teleconference is also available in the description with the rest of this episode's footnotes. The delay in the launch will cause a delay in arrival for the spacecraft due to the longer trip with the orbit alignments. If Psyche launched this year, it would reach the asteroid in 2026. If it launches next year, it will arrive in 2029, and if it launches in 2024, it will arrive in 2030. The most crucial part, however, is that the actual science will not be impacted. The exact same science will be collected just three or four years later than originally planned. Flying alongside Psyche inside the fairing of the Falcon Heavy were going to be two small CubeSats called Janus, which were going to study twin binary asteroid systems. Obviously, now that Psyche has been delayed, these CubeSats will have to find an alternative rideshare flight, or they'll have to serve a completely different mission from their already adapted mission with the first delay. This wasn't a shock to the people behind the mission though, as ride sharing with a big satellite always means you're a second class citizen, whether you like it or not. As many of you will know, personally I'm running a GoFundMe campaign to bring you all the coverage of the Psyche mission live from Florida. I've been asked many questions by many people since this announcement, so I'll clear up the main ones now. I will still be heading to Florida and it will be to cover the Psyche mission. Everything which was purchased were bought in packages which allow rescheduling, even if it meant that they did cost a little bit more money. The only implication with this are the flights, which have a rescheduling deadline. Simply, the amount of money which we've given to the airline is only usable until September 30th, 2023. So if the launch is pushed any further than that date, then some more fundraising will be required to buy new flights. It's a nuisance, but it's how every airline works. Let's talk about SLS. As we discussed last week, the rocket which is being used for the Artemis 1 mission got to T-29 seconds during its most recent wet dress rehearsal attempt, which we've now been told by NASA is enough for the test to be called a success. This means that SLS will soon roll back to the VAB for repairs and the activation of the flight termination system before rolling back out again for launch. As you may know, the countdown was originally meant to reach T-9.34 seconds, however a hydrogen leak, which couldn't be masked from the internal flight computer, ended the countdown 20 seconds earlier. Engineers, however, have looked over the data and have determined that the actions performed between T-29 and T-9 seconds have been tested previously, so not performing those on the wet dress rehearsal isn't a big issue. When SLS returns to the vehicle assembly building, it will need repairs following that hydrogen leak, with NASA planning to replace a seal within the quick disconnect of the tail service mast umbilical. Once repaired, SLS will be rolling down the crawlerway once again, ready for the current window being targeted, which is late August. OneWeb, Starlink Business's commercial competitor, are starting to get back into the groove of their launches after they pulled out of Soyuz flights from the Baikonur Cosmodrome as a result of Russia's invasion of and subsequent war with Ukraine. As a replacement for those Soyuz flights that they lost, OneWeb seeked out two other launch providers. Firstly, their competitor SpaceX, as well as NSIL, the commercial division of the Indian Space Research Organization. For a while, we didn't know when the launches were going to resume, but we were told exactly that by OneWeb executive Maurizio Vanotti on Thursday. OneWeb are planning to be launching again in Q4 of this year, with the final launch for the Constellation commencing in Q2 of next year, 2023. Don't expect a full service around Earth right after though, as it'll still take some time for the satellite's launch to reposition themselves into their correct orbits. That means full, global OneWeb internet coverage should be available by the end of 2023, but no sooner. What you're looking at right now is ISRO's GSLV Mark III rocket, which will be launching the OneWeb satellites. The other vehicle is of course the Falcon 9. 
Being the space agency for the United States of America, you'd expect NASA to be launching their own rockets from their own soil, but that is no longer the case, as they've just launched a sounding rocket from Australia. Yes, yes, it's just a sounding rocket, nothing big and fancy you might say, but it is still exciting. Just listen to their official launch commentator. Five, four, three, two, one, go! The launch of this 5 plus metre tall rocket took place at midnight local time from the Arnhem Space Centre in northern Australia. It exceeded an apogee of 300 kilometres, observing the Alpha Centauri A and B constellations. I will be honest, the launch commentator with the sheer power of the motor under the rocket is the biggest reason why I wanted to include this story. The excitement is just incredible, but it is also pretty awesome to see yet another country start their own journey of rocket launches. Oh. And before I get comments from people trying to teach me about Black Arrow again, I know it exists, but it was retired as soon as it was introduced pretty much, so that doesn't really count as Australia's journey into space today. Time for some launches which actually reached orbit now as we head into space traffic. The first Earth departure to cover this week is the launch of Tian Xing 1 from the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center. Launching at 0208 Coordinated Universal Time on June the 22nd, we have the classic level of information about a Chinese launch. Not a lot. We're told that Tian Xing 1 is a test satellite for space environment detection. Next up, we're headed to South America, Kourou, in French Guiana, where MISAT-3D and GSAT-24 launched atop an Ariane 5 from ELA-3 at the Guyana Space Center at 2250 UTC on the same day. Heading for a geostationary orbit, the Malaysian MISAT-3D will be able to survey its determined region around Malaysia and Southeast Asia, and the Indian GSAT-24 will be able to service the entirety of India, providing high-quality video broadcasting and telecommunications coverage. Another day and another surprise Chinese launch as Yaogan 35 Group 2 launched atop the 60th Long March 2D from the Xichang Satellite Launch Center in China at 0222 UTC on June 23rd. The Yaogan constellation is claimed to be used for science experiments, surveying land and other civilian use cases, but that is just a claim. The payload mass and destination are all unknown, however whatever was inside the fairing ended up in a low Earth orbit. Monday saw yet another launch from China, Ducky-1 on a Long March 4C. Launching from the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center at 1816 UTC on the 27th, Ducky-1 can monitor fine particles such as nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide concentration. 09.55 in the morning UTC or 21.55 in the evening local time on June 28th saw Capstone finally launch on Electron from Launch Complex 1A on the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. This NASA mission weighs in at a light 300 kilograms and it is headed for a near rectilinear halo orbit around our very own moon. That's the same type of orbit which Gateway will be flying, NASA's space station for the Artemis program. Capstone will be flying ahead and testing it out, becoming the first spacecraft to enter such an orbit. It is a very unique orbit as it allows for a constant line of sight to Earth for communications and it provides an hour-long solar eclipse once per orbit. We also had an ISS departure, which was Cygnus NG-17 leaving the Nadir port on the Unity module. It unberthed from the station at 7am dead UTC on the 28th of June, this episode's release date, before being released by the Canada Arm 2 at 11.07 UTC. The difference between an undocking and an unberthing is that the spacecraft is firstly removed by the robotic arm and then released, instead of the spacecraft flying itself away from the station. The cargo vehicle will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere on June 29th. Departing from Earth in the next seven days are SES-22 on a Falcon 9, straight up on Launcher 1, DSEO on a PSLV-CA from the ISR row, and USSF-12 on an Atlas V in the 541 configuration. And here's your space weather with Dr. Tamitha Scove.
Space weather switches gears a bit this week. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, you can see there are still a lot of active regions on the Earth-facing disk. However, none of them are big flare players. Unlike last week, we aren't getting the big radio blackouts that we've kind of used to getting. But we did have from region 3040, we had a big solar storm that's Earth-directed be launched. In fact, it looks beautiful in the chronographs. You can see that big partial halo. However, this happened at a time when we actually lost our imagery due to a power outage up near the source where we get our uh, SDO imagery. So that's still kind of like ramping back up. We're still trying to recover some of those images. So we have to take a look at that when we look at the sun's far side. Meanwhile, solar flux has been dying down a bit. And so we're not getting the radio propagation that we're used to on Earth's day side. However, coming down from that solar storm that we've had over the past couple days, this does mean that uh, uh, Electron flux is ramping up, and therefore we're having some charging issues in GEO. So satellite operators, for those with dealing with space traffic, you're going to have to deal with those uh, ramping charging issues over the next few days. And now switching to our far-sided sun, this is Stereo A, and it's looking at the sun just a little bit from the side. Now you can take a look at Stereo. We actually have data this time from about the 25th on, and on the 26th and into the 27th, you can start seeing around region 30, 40, and a little bit to the north, kind of some slow changes. Well, those slow changes are actually that solar storm that's Earth-directed. That was it launching. We're hoping to get some better imagery soon, but this is the best we've got right now. Models show that this storm should hit Earth right about midday on the 1st. So you geo satellite operators, as you're dealing with that surface charging and internal charging, don't worry about it because as soon as a solar storm hits, all that flux will be flushed and you should be able to be in the clear. For more details on this week's space weather, including how that Earth-directed solar storm might affect you, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Unsurprisingly, Station 204 is not a cheap thing to operate, which is why these generous people on your screen now have helped to chip in, allowing us to make the content which I'm guessing you're enjoying watching. There are several different tiers running from system support, who don't get their name in the show, ground support, suborbital, orbital, and then escape velocity, who provide a substantial contribution, which we are extremely grateful for. We also provide a super high up tier, which allows the citizens to design their own slate, and this is NeuroStreams. Thank you for being a Tomorrow Model 33 Plan Pro Plus citizen, it is greatly appreciated. Once again, if you want to support my GoFundMe campaign, then click the card in the corner and to help however you want to, it would be greatly appreciated. To make sure you are always up to date in the world of spaceflight and you aren't being fed some rubbish about SLS being a failure and Falcon Heavy being incredible, make sure to subscribe so our videos are pushed to you more often. YouTube will also sometimes push our videos a lot, even if you aren't subscribed, so just check and make sure. We should be back on Friday with a live show, so make sure to tune in then as well. Thank you for watching and goodbye.